Well, good morning, everybody. I think we're going to start. Welcome to the Leaders Walk this morning on this really chilly morning. I hope you're all, all doing well. Um, I think we're going to start and whoever is uh, joins will join as we on our way. So we're really excited to have Kalnisha with us here this morning. Um, she's going to talk to you how South Africa changed the world of business forever. And as you know, we don't go through any lengthy introductions to the um, to the speakers because you've all had their profiles and everything. So, Kalnish, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Well, Kalnish, I'm going to hand over to you and, you know, feel free to give a little bit of a background to you as you start. Um, everybody has got your profile and what you're going to speak about today, but over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited and a little bit intimidated by the audience. Um, so please bear with me and be gentle. I'm going to share my uh, screen quickly. But just in way of background, I am a development economist. I run an organization called Katie Strategies and have done so for the last 20 years. So it's been a while. Um, our particular work is in the area of transformation and sustainability, um, but specifically across three tiers. So we design and execute local economic development strategies in under-resourced areas. We also work on industrial development, so designing strategies for local industrialization, local supply chain development for new and growing industries. So the most exciting um, industry right now is renewable energy and uh, green hydrogen and we're doing a lot of work a lot of work on local industrialization and those value chains and the third tier of the work that we do is for specific specifically for corporates in designing their transitions from whatever their current state is to a more inclusive transformative um, and particular strategy um, what that means is that um, in South Africa, we work a lot in terms of broad-based Black economic empowerment. Um, and recently, the questions around sustainability, ESG, uh, and creating shared value. So that's enough, I suppose, in the way of my background. I'm hoping the screen will decide to share. Um, Coming right, Kalnisha. Seems to be doing something. Yes, there we I'm, go. I'm, but you're not sharing. Yeah, if you go to share in your window. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where you've got share and then share your window. Yes. You should pick up your slides and then select the the thing with your slides. Oh no, it's not. There we go. <laughs> Organized, there we go. Can you see them? Because I can't. Yeah, we can see your going. slides. Just put it on to slideshow the. There we go. Okay, so one of one of my favorite topics is really around how South Africa and South Africa's economic history has influenced the world of business and how. Um, but also how we think in South Africa that our, our economic history is, is very, very unique. Um, and we get sort of grounded and a little bit despondent in this feeling of uniqueness and aloneness um, as a country, as industries, as individual businesses. And what's really interesting is that the lessons learned in South Africa and the innovation and creativity, it, it, explored in South Africa has really influenced a lot of different industries, um, a lot of different business ideas and processes um, across the world and across 
time, right? Um, and so what we're going to do today is just go through a little bit of a chronology of events that happened that catalyzed and sparked points of change that have really influenced the current uh, business narrative, uh, both locally and internationally. And I'll focus, so my focus specifically is in the kind of themes of transformation and sustainability. And I know that they're not often um, linked, especially in our content context uh, in this country, but we can only achieve sustainability or start working towards the sustainable development goals and achieving what we call a just economic transition if we engage quite actively with the concept of transformation. Um, so let's start there. What is transformation? Um, transformation is effectively a global economic driver that encourages all stakeholders in a society to address fundamental gaps that exist in the fabric of the economy so as to result in a better and more sustainable outcome for everybody. And that's essentially it. It's changing from one state of being into another state of being, which I think everybody in this room understands quite well. Um, and in, in an organizational context, transformation is the process of profound and radical change that orients the organization in a new direction and takes it to an entire, entirely different level of effectiveness. And effectiveness is quite important because in all transformative activity, what we are looking to achieve is an improved level of effectiveness. So even in our conversations around diversity and inclusion, while we are obviously from a social perspective, we want to see representative workforces, we want to see the removal of systemic and other barriers to entry and promotion, what we also want to achieve is an improved level of collective effectiveness, right? Um, but we will also get to that in a little bit. Um, what we've noticed in the last couple of years is that conversations around ESG reporting have become increasingly popular, especially in South Africa. Uh, well, about a decade ago, about 10 years ago, those conversations were only being had in the sort of financial services sector in the capital markets. Um, but it does seem for us that alignment with these reporting frameworks is becoming increasingly important for business. It's becoming an increasingly dominant thought, both from a market relevance and a market marketing and communications perspective. Um, at the same time, what's interesting in our local context is that discussions around local economic development. So whether that local economic development is in the form of broad-based black economic empowerment, which, apply, which applies to the general business community, or in the form of specific industrial policies, such as the Renewable Energy um, Independent Power Producers Program, REAP, those conversations still remain quite heated, quite emotive, um, and quite negative. Um, and at the same time, while, while those two sort of dichotomous conversations are happening, somewhere at the back of, the, uh, of our minds still remains the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The awareness that we are in a general state of, of crisis, right? Um, there's the environmental and climate crisis. We have social and political crises on this continent. Um, there's a global food crisis. We have an education crisis, unemployed graduates, corruption, maladministration, load shedding potholes, and our list kind of goes on and on and on if we choose to walk down that road. What is very difficult for us to ignore, though, is that these three kind of conversations around ESG reporting from a business perspective, local economic development from a compliance perspective, and the general sense of a need to move towards a more sustainable future is these conversations are happening independently of each other, right? Despite being inextricably linked. Um, so why, why are we missing the linkages? Why are we not connecting the dots? So Maya Angelou um, famously said, you can't really know where you're going until you know where you've been. Um, so I really want, uh, my intention for the conversation this morning is not necessarily for us to start solving for the crises, although we have to at some point, um, or even addressing ESG reporting or BE compliance, but rather it's 
it's more of a meander, a gentle walk through the historical events that influenced how businesses, industries, and economies are being shaped, and the role of our country, either directly or indirectly, in changing the course of economic history. And I believe that's an important conversation to have, because once you realize this, the small sparks that happened that changed the course of history, maybe you will also be inspired to make those small shifts yourself and potentially change the course of the future for us, right? What we really need in this country right now is a more inspired vision for the future towards collectively and and really change the course of history for for future generations. So the request right here at this moment is that we all just take a deep breath and get ready to take this walk together because it can get a little bit hairy, a little bit emotional maybe a little bit political, um, but let's just see where we go. The Global South has a deep-seated history of legislated economic exclusion, right? We all know this and we all understand this. Um, modern economies were built on the basis that by excluding and subjugating certain populations, portions of populations or demographics or cultures in the global south, the global north were able to thrive through exploitative means. Now, it sounds, it sounds very emotional and political, but that's exactly what happened, right? The global north were able to prosper through their, you know, assumption of property rights in the colonies. And then by assuming property rights in the colonies, they were able to exploit local labor in order to extract wealth. We understand how this works. It's still happening today. Um, but the economic exclusion is really, really important to consider when we understand today, again, in modern, in modern economic times, that economic development is demand driven, right? And by demand, I mean the ability of individuals living within an, econ in, within an economy to demand goods and services to meet their needs and wants. What like exclusion does is it removes the ability or constrains the ability for people, for seg segments of people, to demand goods and services in an economy, which fundamentally affects the ability of that economy to grow or develop from an economic perspective. Right. And right now at this point or, or at this juncture in the conversation, it's it's the natural instinct to start talking about apartheid in South Africa um, as the specific starting point of our story. But the reality is that our tangle with economic exclusion goes back a lot further than the onset of apartheid in 1948. The first documented legislation enforcing South Africa is the Masters and Servants Act of 1856, almost 100 years before apartheid was legislated. But even then, we all know of the slave trade. And from as early as, from as, early as 1600, when with the Dutch East India Trading Company and other traders traveling along those spice routes, right? The question here is, so why does economic exclusion uh, impact economic development? Why, how does a, a legislated economic ex exclusion impact development? So we're going to go on a little bit of an economics lecture right now. Um, this is Rostow's model of economic development. It's, it suggests there's five specific stages of development that an economy goes through. It's very much like you know, when your child is growing and you track the milestones. These are the five milestones that economy set in the process of development. Um, most economies start at stage one, which is traditional society, agriculture, and they move on to stage two, transitional stage, where. Um, yeah, 
um, the transitional stage is where specialization happens, surplus as infrastructure development happens. We move into industrialization, then maturity, then high mass consumption. What happened in South Africa and in other countries where there was systemized legislated economic exclusion is that 84% or majority of the population were being encumbered down at stage one, the traditional society, right? They, their economic potential was not allowed to exceed that level of economic development, while 16% of the population was being propelled towards high mass consumption. And if you know and understand maths, you know that in, in this kind of scenario, steady state is going to happen closer where, to where the majority is, right? So if I show you this model in a different way, um, because 84% of the economic potential of the country was being held back at that transitional or traditional stage, our economy was achieving steady state at pre-takeoff levels, which means that by excluding um, or by implementing systematic economic exclusion um, and excluding 84% of the population from economic participation, um, this was bad for everybody. Everybody was worse off. Right. And then in 1977. Um, Sorry, Kalnisha, just won't you just hold on a second? I'm just want to see who's on the call that's that's not muted. Everybody, please mute yourself if you are not um, Kalnisha. Thanks, Kalnisha. Sure, no problem. So the great part, the great turning point in our history, um, apart from the fact that, you know, the apartheid government started understanding the limitations on the economic pro pro progress of the country, was that the international community started making a noise about um, what was going on in South Africa, right? So in 1977, one particular senior business leader, um, essentially just had enough. Uh, American-born Leon Sullivan was a member of the board of General Motors, the largest employer of South Africans outside the mining industry at that point in time. Uh, he was also an African-American Baptist minister. And um, understanding that America had just gone through the chaos that they did with the end of the Vietnam War, um, he really started becoming very, very active and vocal about uh, civil rights um, and specifically anti-apartheid uh, policies and um, advocacy, right? And in 1977, he drafted a code of conduct, which was then approved by the Board of General Motors and, and implemented organization-wide. It essentially comprised seven principles, what, what we now know as the Sullivan principles, effectively saying that segregation will not be tolerated in the workplace, right? There will be no separate eating facilities, no separate comfort facilities, no separate work facilities. Everybody's going to get the equal pay for, for the same job. Um, they are going to initiate development and training programs for everybody without exclusion in their workforce across the world. And they are specifically going to work towards improving the life of black employees and non-white employees in management and supervisory positions. So it was a rip roaring memorandum and code of conduct that was approved through General Electric and then implemented in South Africa. And the motivation was if we are not allowed to implement these policies within our company that we want to implement, then we will not, not work in your country, right? And what it started was the systematic disinvestment campaign that was led by the Americans and other companies follow suit. If you remember the history of South Africa, there was a huge disinvestment, economic sanctions imposed against South Africa for as long as apartheid continued after 1977. Right. Kalnisha, yes. Sorry, um, sorry to interrupt again. Your slides aren't moving with you. So um, everybody's only got your first slide up. So if you want to move down to where 
we should be. Sorry to interrupt you again. Cool. I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, and then just put it on to slideshow view. Yeah, are you with me? It's still not on slideshow. It's, it's still, so just go click on your bottom right, on just below the. Yeah, it's on slideshow for me, so I wonder if there's just a lag. Okay, because it's not on for us, but anyway, that's that's fine. But just, I'll I'll just double check if it moves with you. Okay. So, okay. Um, so, I are you seeing movement? No. My oh, goodness. Just maybe go to the top of the bar and where it says slideshow and let's see if we can go slideshow from current slide. Maybe it will work there. Do you see it now? No. Because it is it is a slideshow. I see thing. your cursor going over the slideshow, but it's not it's not changing it to slideshow mode. Oh, that's so bizarre. Anyway, that's that's Maybe fine. Just uh, she can click from the beginning on the left where it says from the beginning. It should play it as a slide where she was. No, but if it takes from the beginning, it's going to take her back to the beginning of the slideshow. Then she will page down. Yeah, but it will be on display mode. Yeah. I'm going to try something. Do you see it now? Yep, there we go. Fantastic, and it's moving. Very cool, okay. Not entirely IT competent. Um, so we were talking about Leon Sullivan. This is what he looks like. Um, when when he was asked about his anti-apartheid movement he sort of reflected that starting with the workplace he's tightened the screws step by step and raised the bar step by step so his decision 1977 wasn't just that he woke up one morning and decided that this is what i'm going to do it was something that he reflected on obviously over a long period of time and then eventually he says i got to the point where i said that companies must practice corporate civil disobedience against the laws and I threatened South Africa and said in two years Mandela must be freed, apartheid must end and blacks must vote or else I'll bring every American company I can out of South Africa. And we know that in fact that he did, right? Um, the publication of the Sullivan principles catalyzed the South African disinvestment campaign and we went through a period in this country of, of really some economic darkness, right, in the 1980s when we were sort of coming to terms with economic san sanctions and feeling the reality of, of what that meant for us as a country. And we also know that that sort of economic hurt really motivated the National Party government to start thinking about freeing Mandela, ending apartheid, and everything that came after that. Right. The Sullivan Principles were eventually adopted by the United Nations and led to the drafting of the UN um, Guiding Principles on Human Rights. It's something that's applied in every workplace now, um, especially JSE listed companies. When you are reporting uh, to your Social and Ethics Committee, the frameworks for Social and Ethics Committee were based on these uh, UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. And, and however, while the world was getting on board to fight social injustice in the global south and in South Africa specifically. They were also waking up to the fact 
that economic, that up until that point, economic growth was also seemingly synonymous with environmental degradation. Um, and environmental threats were becoming very, very hard to ignore. The hole in the ozone layer, acid drain was being talked about, deforestation was a re complete reality. Soil erosion and desertification was happening at a faster pace. And large oil spills like this one you see on, on the screen right now, which we understand is very, very harmful for the environment in terms of marine ecology, and also very, very harmful in terms of corporate image in today's time. Um, these large oil spills were counterintuitively seen to create economic benefit from a dollars and cents or rands and cents perspective, uh, particularly through the cleanup activities that directly created jobs, uh, brought in increased revenue to, to the beneficiary or to the affected community, um, through media and other tourism and stimulated local businesses because of it, right? So this very, very big catastrophic uh, environmental event was seen to create economic benefit, which was very, very counterintuitive at the time. And then because of the, the sort of widespread adoption of, of uh, household TVs at that stage and specifically live TV and live news coverage, the realities of the social injustice and the catastrophic environmental events were being broadcast around the world and global society was becoming more and more aware of these atrocities and the counterintuitive link between economic environmental harm and economic benefit. So in the 1980s, our humanitarian crisis in South Africa was being fought locally and globally. And at the same time, the world was grappling with how to deal with the environmental crisis, how to reconcile economic accounting. Um, and, and doing these things without compromising economic growth and development. And in 1987, the Brundtland Commission, a commission by the United Nations and sponsored by the government of Norway, published the first volume of what is now called Our Common Future, the Brundtland Report. Um, the report, the main feature of this report is the concept of sustainable development. It's the first actual introduction of a definition for what is sustainable development. And it, and it says that sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So in 1987, this document presented three pillars of sustainable development. The first being economic growth, the second being uh, environmental protection, and lastly, social equality and equity. And finally, we had the beginnings of a framework for a different way of doing business. At the same time, the disinvestment campaign in South Africa was showing its effectiveness and the tide was beginning to turn on to mark the end of apartheid. Um, and we kind of all know what happens next, right? It's the beautiful Rainbow Nation story. Nelson Mandela was released. We had our first democratic elections um, in 1994. And the political liberation of our country um, saw a new wave of socioeconomic policies that started driving foreign direct, or that would, had the intention of driving foreign direct investment back into the country, um, local industrialization, uh, economic growth, redistribution of wealth to enable or create uh, uh, lowering of the Gini co coefficient and greater equality and, and a beautiful set of socioeconomic policies that are intended to achieve our, eco our collective economic freedom, right? Um, what happened in that period between 1994 and 1998 was that we really led the charge as a country in turning the Sullivan principles, these very basic concepts of human rights and dignity in the workplace into a legislative framework for employment equity, right? The first version of our Employment Equity Act was published in 1998. And then many countries around the world followed suit, right? And instituted their versions of the act. So currently today, 
Australia, Canada, the USA, Belgium, Malaysia, Britain, Northern Ireland, and India all have a version of the Employment Equity Act that is inextricably linked with ours. And that's quite a beautiful thing. At the same time as the Employment Equity Act was published in South Africa, we also had other sort of progressive transformative acts being um, legislated. So we had at the same time the Skills Development Act, the Skills Development Levies Act that looked to promote investment in um, training and development, but also incentivize uh, the private sector for investing in the training and development of their employees. And while this was happening and all of these social um, socially influenced uh, policies were being implemented in the country. There was also the question of how do we now shift the economic situation? How do we reframe what our economy looks like? How do we build an economy that is fundamentally inclusive? Was happening, right? So the, the, first, the first policy in or the first framework for this sort of wide scale inclusion was drafted, the white paper on BE, by some very, very smart young professionals, right? They researched the most resilient economies from around the world, the most inclusive economies from around the world, the economies with the least employ unemployment. They also tested corporate best practices. It was a very robust, rigorous academic study that was done in order to, to um, publish the first draft, the first white paper on BE. And it was a beautifully layered policy proposal that considered what motivates employees to stay um, employed, right? How do you incentivize employees to stay employed? How do you use that, those retention strategies to grow businesses or catalyze the growth of businesses? How do we look at industrial development and encourage investment in supply chain development? How, how do we at the same time take our communities along for the ride with us, right? Not excluding anybody from economic benefit. It really was, really is a beautiful document to read. And then as fate would have it, the publication of the draft white paper on BEE coincided exactly with the first utterances of creating shared value by Michael Porter in the hallowed classrooms of the Harvard Business School, right? Porter proposed in his creating shared value model that we can create commercial value by creating societal value through a business model that considered employee ownership, supply chain development, and contributions to societal development, right? So I'm gonna say those again. We can create commercial value by creating societal value through employee ownership, supply chain development, con and contributions to social development, right? Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School suggested this model that sounds so similar, so similar to our BE framework, right? The striking similarities between these two frameworks may be testimony to universal synchronicity. So like how Nikolai Tesla and Thomas Edison both had the idea to figure out electricity on different parts of the world, right? It could be that universal synchronicity, or it could be related to the fact that many members at that time of the Black Management Forum attended Harvard Business School and had the opportunity to share their ideas in those classrooms. Right, that's something to ponder on. But while all of this positivity and great transition was happening, obviously there needed to be a spanner in the works. And on in comes the 1997-1998 Asian, Asian market or Asian financial crisis. And at the same time, the cracks in governance procedure, uh, protocols and all these different like very high level companies were starting to show. And in 2001, we had the Enron fiasco, 
um, and which amongst other factors led the whole world to reconsider governance models. Right. The role of the financial markets and ultimately the human elements within our models of doing business and reporting were being fundamentally questioned. And in response to this, in, in response to the financial and governance crisis and all of this reconsideration of how we do business and how we report, our very own Mervyn King published the King Go Codes for Good Practice or the revised the King Codes for Good Practice. So the King 2, which becomes a globally applicable uh, reporting mechanism and framework for good governance practices in corporate and good sustainability practices in corporate. Now King 2 was introduced to the rest of the world at the third UN Conference on Environment and Development, right here in Joburg in 2002. And this is where the United Nations Environmental Program and the UN Global Con Compact joined forces to further engage with the industry, with industry and other, uh, other key stakeholders on the integration of sustainability into, into economic development considerations. And they laid the foundations for the definition of principles of responsible investment. And that, is a very, that was a very imp important turning point for us. Because the UN Principles of Responsible invest Investment, which was launched in 2005, is the foundational framework for ESG as we know it today. Right. So all these key turning points in history that are fundamentally reshaping the way that we are doing business, forcing us to, to consider issues of, environmental, of, of the environment, issues of social justice, and issues of governance and transparency, all collectively um, were decisions taken by the global by the global society right here in South Africa. All the factors that led to the framing of, of, of these very important frameworks were fueled by issues that we were ha that we had in the global south collectively, but specifically here in South Africa. Right. The question now is, like where to from here, knowing the crucial role that South Africa and South Africans had in shaping the global trend that we seem to now be working or walking on, where do we go? Right. So again, I'm going to take us back in time a little bit. Uh, Winston Churchill, um, is rumored to have said that history is written by the victors, implying that those in positions of power have the leverage to dictate the narrative. On our, con on our continent and in our country, the victors are, are represented by those who assumed power. Um, through colonization initially, through religious missions, and through the imposition of fundamentally foreign laws and rules. Great. In 1963, uh, Oxford historian Hugh Trevor Roper, he's quite famous, uh, said that perhaps in the future there will be some African history to teach. But at the present, there is none. There is only the history of the Europeans in Africa. The rest is darkness, and darkness is not the subject of history. What's really interesting for us right now, if you read just the course around ESG reporting or sustainable business or sustainable investing, particularly those courses offered by the international education community. So I, I attended a course at Harvard Business School last year. And all of these academics are citing the starting point of ESG as 2013, the point where American institutions decided to incorporate uh, these frameworks into their methodologies. But in reality, we know that ESG has been a consideration since 2005, at least when the report was published, but even before that, since 2002, when the conversations were had in Joburg. Right. The, my frequent um, contemplation of, of this economic history and the reason I wanted to share it with you today 
is that is that it it shows us that it takes very very few well placed individuals in history to change the course of the future, right? But at the same time, it's very very important for us to acknowledge our own role in the course of history. Because if we don't, then we allow other people to write the history for us. Um, the time really has come for us as South Africans and for the rest of the continent to start writing our own history. We get to choose what we focus on, the elements of our today that will influence the stories we tell our children and will leave for, for future generations and how their history is, is framed. And right now in South Africa, our economy is at a very, very exciting tipping point. Like I know we burdened with potholes and load shedding and you know, political instability and, and all of this is phenomenal. South Africa is leading the globe right now in renewable energy procurement and, and distribution, right? We are leading the world right now in the production and export of green hydrogen. We are leading the world in um, hybrid renewable energy solutions. Um, and in every industry, in every industry across our country right now, there is huge innovation, there's huge creativity, and there's focus on growth. And I don't think that those stories are being told effectively and I really do believe that the time is now for everyone and everyone in this in this room to start sharing those stories um, to inspire a greater vision for tomorrow for all of us and that's it from me thank you so much Kalnish and I think if you look in the chat box you'll see the the feedback coming through and uh, Nicole's covered the Sullivan principles in her master's thesis and she's saying fascinating. Um, Sarah said a powerful question, where to from here? Uh, Dr. Augusta said thank you for this remarkable synopsis of history and the impact made. So I think you can see that um, you've made a real impact this morning. Any questions for Kalnisha? Nicole, over to you. Morning, Kalnisha. Thank you for that um, synopsis. And it really covers our journey as, as a country and how much influence we've had in uh, global uh, movements, right? And, and, and I don't think you're right. The story is being told how it, it really, uh, the journey started with those Sullivan principles, evolved into the codes, the triple B codes, um, eventually made its way to, you know, this UN um, you know, frameworks and, and um, SDG goals. I think the question is really get, having had this powerful, all of these very great frameworks, ambitious goals globally, um, what in your mind do we zoom in and can we achieve? I mean, if you take, for example, there's, there's one um, SDG, um, no zero poverty. It is, is extremely um, ambitious, but can we really achieve that? Um, you know, you just you just try and, and sometimes reflect, are these really practically achievable with all the best will in the world? And I know there's a saying that says collaboration is the new competition. And I do believe collaboration is an excellent vehicle to drive um, impact. Uh, but just, you know, from a from a practical point of view, what is your view on some of the SDGs, on some of our, um, you know, ESG goals and how we can practically, you know, address them in a more meaningful way? Um, that's such a great question. So I think. I think the the SDGs are. Are intimidating. But I think intentionally so. I mean, we have we have a lot of work to do to sort of re um, or to we have a lot of work to do to correct the imbalances that we've created in 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 the global economy, right? And poverty is one of those extreme examples that we like we've created that problem collectively. Um, 
I read an article a couple of days ago, and, and I'll, I'll share it afterwards so that so that Colleen can share it with everybody. Um, that says that there actually is enough money in circulation to right now today to end poverty um, forever, to 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 enable uh, a livelihood and a level of well-being for everybody on on, on Earth. Um, and that's just money in circulation. And I think the opportunity for us in in this country and on on our continent is to understand where does this money sit and what's what's it what is it being invested in. Um, the global impact investment market has something like I don't know fifteen trillion dollars worth of funds intended for impact. Um, that they say that that they can't find pipeline for. They're not finding the deals. They're not finding the projects to invest in. Um, and the challenge that we have and that we're seeing in the development space is that the projects exist, but they're not big enough. The fundamental problem that we have as South Africans working in impact, working in development, is that we're not thinking big enough. Right? We're not thinking big enough to attract the dollars uh, in our in our initiatives. So I think that to answer your question more succinctly, I think that the problems can be solved. I think that the goals can be achieved. It's up to us to, to have those big audacious visions and, and then be willing to, to rise to the challenge. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments for Kalnisha? No? Kalnisha, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Just to let everybody know that Kalnisha did agree to the recording. So after the session, we will download the recording. It will be on the Business Engage YouTube channel as, as normal. So if you want to go and find the recording, uh, please go and, go and fetch it there. Second of all, the um, article that Kalnisha um, referred to, for those of you who have booked for the events via the website, I'll be able to send that to you. For those of you that have joined via the just via the link, um, please do drop me a note if you want to receive the um, the article, because otherwise I won't know how to get hold of you. But Kalnisha, thank you so much once again for being with us this morning. Thank you to everybody for being with us and on this really chilly morning. So have an awesome day, an awesome weekend, and we'll see you at the next event. Have thank a great so day, much. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.